Hi there. Thanks for joining us again. This is Space Nuts. My name is Andrew Dunkley, your host. It's always good to have your company, whether it's live right now as it's happening or sometime in the future. And that could be days, weeks, months, years, who knows. Uh, on this episode, we'll be looking at another discovery on Mars, this time by the Curiosity rover, which has stumbled across a cluster of rock that has um, revealed something very interesting indeed. Uh, we'll also be looking at the unique orbit of an exoplanet. Uh, it is really strange, but it, it might actually be answering some questions about how super hot Jupiter's um, get where they're going, I suppose. And uh, the eternal question, to pee or not to pee, we'll be answering that one on this episode of Space Nuts. 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space Nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And joining us again is Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Hello, Andrew. Uh, still at large, um, still astronoming. So I guess, yes. Ast astronoming. That's yeah. a verb, is it? <laughs> <laughs> a verb to astronom. Yes. Yeah, I like it. Astronoming. Yep. Yeah, we'll save that one up for a special occasion. Maybe so. Um, yeah. How's everything in your world? We've actually got sunshine for the first time in weeks today. It's oh, really? Um, yeah, out here in the west of New South Wales, Central West, uh, we have been under cloud for, it was nearly getting on towards a month solid of cloudy days Yeah, um, with the occasional blip of sun. But today is actually full on sunshine. And um, yes, it's amazing how your eyes suddenly aren't used to it and everything's so glary. It's <laughs> truly bizarre. Well, it's the, the light uh, where you live, um, I think it's a bit different from where I live, uh, which is at a lower altitude and near the coast, probably a lot more aerosols in the air. Yeah. Uh, there was a very blue sky outside uh, this morning, but I know from having lived where you live pretty well, uh, just how intensely bright the light can be when there's mm. really nothing to filter it out uh, because the air's so clear. Yeah, it's it's actually quite beautiful. Our, yeah. our skies are the most blue that I've seen anywhere. To be yeah. honest, um, yeah, it's it's glorious, and everyone's now jealous. Uh, I'll take a photo of it one day. I did publish a blue a blue just a, a, a I took a photo of the sky one day, and it was just a blue rectangle. Yeah, <laughs> it just looked amazing. Not a, not a cloud, not a glitch, not a bird, nothing. Um, okay, let's uh, get stuck into it, Fred. And our first story concerns Mars. Strange that we'd be talking about Mars because you know we've hardly ever mentioned it. But uh, let's um, look at this story because they have made a discovery courtesy of the Curiosity rover, which literally, quite literally, drove over a rock, cracked it open, and they went, hello, 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 what's all this then? <laughs> they they found something unique. They did. That's right. They found uh, sulfur crystals, yellow sulfur, um, mm. which is the stuff that uh, you tend to find around the, um, you know, the craters of volcanoes. Um, this place is. I, I've on, been on the craters of volcanoes. I've seen it. Sulfur. Yes, it's That's there. Right. As I have too. Uh, so it's it's um, yeah. Look, it, it's uh, really really interesting. What's um, I guess um, perhaps the most intriguing aspect of this story is that nobody expected it. And not only did they not expect it, they thought, no, this is never going to happen. Uh, but it has. Um, so it turns out that there's only, there's really only a limited set of conditions that can allow sulfur to form in this manner, this pure. Um, sulfur element, uh, crystals of it. Uh, and the region where the Curiosity rover is, where it stood on this rock, uh, and apparently they've discovered other ones similar to it nearby, uh, but that re region was never thought to have the conditions in which sulfur can form. And so it was su such a big surprise. Um, mm. Uh, and even more surprising, as I, as I said, when they discovered more of these. Uh, so uh, where is the spacecraft? Well, it's uh, in a place called Gale Crater, uh, which 
as we've mentioned many times before, is named after an Australian amateur astronomer uh, who was active in the um, early 20th century. Uh, Gale Crater has a has a central peak uh, which is called Mount Sharp, uh, and it's uh, that peak that uh, is really what what the the whole mission was was set out to do when it landed in 2012. Curiosity, it's been there a while. Yes, uh, and fabulous, isn't it? That that's right. And the the reason that that place was chosen. Uh, yeah, it's extraordinary that it's still going strong. Um, mm. The reason that place was chosen was because uh, Mount Sharp has a uh, sort of gash in the side of it, um, a, a valley uh, which is called the Gedits, Gedits Valleys. Uh, I'm not sure whether I'm pronouncing the Gedits correctly, but that's my best guess, G-E-D-I-Z, Gedis Valis, uh, the Ged- Gedis Valley, I guess in, it translates from the Latin. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a, a cleft in the side of Mount Sharp that goes right down to the base of the mountain. And so what that does, uh, that sort of opens up the strata, uh, and it means that you've, you know, that, by following that that valley uh, up the up the mountain, you're going progressively to younger and younger rocks uh, in the in the stratification of the of the rock layers that have been laid down. Uh, and we're talking now about billions of years ago, of course. Uh, but there's also uh, the added, um, I guess, angle on this uh, that ancient floods and landslides might well have have uh, contributed to that. Uh, and that's why, you know, it's such an interesting place. It's the reason why Curiosity was sent there in the first place. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it looks as though, yes, that floods and landslides have played a role uh, in forming this landscape with the sediments and rock piles. And there seems to be a ridge that's been left by violent flows of water. Um, but that is perhaps... Uh, then suggestive of the kind of environment that might allow the sulfur to be formed, because uh, so, so element, the, you know, just pure sulfur, the element itself, not mixed with any other ides, uh, or anything to make it sulfides. Uh, sulfur itself uh, is, is, as I said, only formed in a, in a narrow range of conditions. And what this suggests is that apparently um, the thinking about the origins of this valley in particular and the, some of the features in, in Gale Crater, uh, that they are now, uh, they, what they've done is they've now uh, kind of tightened down the conditions under which that happened because they know that sulfur formed there. Uh, so um, now I think they're still still studying the details of this, the mission scientists. So we might hear more about what this means in terms of the history of Mars and the history of this particular part of Mars a bit down the track. Now, as I understand it, sulfur is not uncommon on Mars. They've found traces of it in other places, but to find it in this form, as you said at the start, is is a bit of a surprise. Yes, I think usually it's bound up with other elements um, mm. to, to make sulfides and sulfates. Copper sulfates, one you know, we know we know about these these from year 10 chemistry and things like that um but this is pure sulfur and i think that i think that in itself is not as common as as some of the other uh, forms of sulfur okay so are there any theory like is this because of volcanic activity at some stage or possibly yeah mixed mixed with water i think is the you know i think that's the um the element here that it, it's again put um basically pointing to the idea that uh, this was once a warm and wet place uh, and perhaps the, you know, volcanism at that time or, or tectonic activity of some sort might have been what drove the formation of the sulphur. Mm, fantastic. It, it just keeps bringing up surprises though, doesn't it, Mars? And, you know, the more we look at it, the more we are surprised by what we can discover and uh, it just keeps throwing these curveballs at us. It does indeed, yeah, and um, you know that's why it's why it's such an intriguing place because you never quite know what's going to turn up next. I mean, when you think of it, 
uh, um, Andrew, here we are sitting on Earth, and we know that there's two, well, there's actually three rovers on Mars, uh, because the Chinese rover's there too, that are, that are exploring the planet day by day uh, to places that have never been visited by human intellect, whether it's robotic or, or in person. Uh, and, yeah, who knows what we might turn up next. That's the, always the excitement about Mars. Yes, and you've got to give the engineers so much credit. Uh, curiosity, uh, I'm, I'm guessing it's already passed its use-by date and it's still going. Yeah, that's right. Like, um, you know, as the, the other rovers on Mars, remember Spirit and Opportunity, they yeah. outlasted their use-by date. They're both defunct now, but they lasted much, much longer than they were meant to, as, mm. as I think as Curiosity as well. Yes, it's a, they should make jet planes out of these, whatever they make these rovers out of. That's what I reckon. <laughs> Stay up. Well, they do. You quite often find yourself travelling in a 30-year-old jet. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. I, I remember years ago uh, when I was doing a radio quiz, I, I did some research to find out which plane was the oldest one still flying, and it was an old uh, 747 Boeing Jumbo. Yeah. And it had been, it had been in the air for like 35 years or yes. something. <clears throat> Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. Um, not in one flight. No. But, you know, <clears throat> it had been up there. A, no. <clears throat> no, it had been up there a heck of a long time. Um, yeah. Um, in fact, I, I think they had to wind down the windows with a little lever. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just kidding. Uh, but if you want to chase up that story about the, the sulfur discovery on Mars, you can go to nasaspaceflight.com and uh, check it out there. This is Space Nuts, Andrew Dunkley with Professor Fred Watson. Roger, you're live. Sir, here also. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, uh, let's uh, look at this exoplanet that has uh, been discovered. Uh, it was discovered a few years ago, but now they've been able to do some more analysis on this planet, and they've discovered that its orbit is unique and very, very extreme. But uh, it might uh, actually be worth studying because they, they think this this might be a pattern that is not uncommon ultimately. That, that's right, yes. It's something that's kind of been caught in the act in a way. <laughs> mm. um, all right, let's 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 tell everybody what we're talking about. We're talking about a planet called TIC 24124953 b <laughs> um, So that puts it well into context. It's about five times the mass of Jupiter. Uh, but what is utterly surprising i mean this this is a big surprise to me it's actually for me it's more surprising than sulfur on mars uh is its orbit the shape of its orbit uh and it's very very elongated <clears throat> excuse me um uh, unlike most of the planets that we know which uh, certainly in in our solar system the planets are in very well behaved circular orbits almost circular they're not quite but very nearly <clears throat> and we think that that um that the planets have arrived in that situation over many hundreds of millions of years of of evolution of the orbits the orbits themselves change um now the thinking in contemporary uh planets uh, planetary science is that Big planets like Jupiter form a long way out from a star, and that's kind of where they are in our own solar system. Uh, but one of the things that we observe uh, in when we look at many, many exoplanets, um, and there's something like 5,600 confirmed now, mm. but about up to a tenth of those, maybe a bit less than a tenth of those, are what are called hot Jupiters. They're planets with the mass of Jupiter or greater, which are orbiting very, very close to their parent star. Sometimes they've got orbits that go, you know, around in two or three days, that they're whizzing around their parent stars. And so hot Jupiters is, is what they are. And the thinking in planetary science is that, that they, these hot Jupiters weren't always where, you know, where we find them because they can't really have formed there. So they must have come from a place more distant in their that respective solar system. In other words, right. they might form somewhere like where 
Jupiter is in our own solar system and then migrate inwards over a period of time. And the thinking is that to do that, they'd have to go through a phase where their orbits were very elongated. Uh, you know, they, they, it's kind of, they, they, they may spiral in gently, but there is thinking that they, they undergo a short period where they've got very elongated orbits, which take them a long way out and brings them very close into their parent stars. And that's exactly what's been found in this particular case with uh, TIC, whatever it was, 2412, yeah. et cetera. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, uh, because its orbit is extraordinary. Now, um, let me – we can put figures on that because um, we – uh, in orbital dynamics have a number that characterizes how elongated an orbit is, and it's called the eccentricity mm. of an orbit. Uh, so orbits are a shape called an ellipse, and an ellipse has this number associated with it, uh, which is the eccentricity, and that number tells you how elongated the ellipse is. So let's start with the Earth. Uh, the Earth is in, it does go around the sun in an elliptical orbit, but it is so close to a circle that its eccentricity is very small. It's 0 0.02. Um, you go up uh, through the planets and dwarf planets and look for something with a high eccentricity in our own solar system, and you come to Pluto, uh, which um, always baffled scientists because its eccentricity is so much greater than your average planet. Uh, that's before we re recognize that it's not really a planet, uh, but a dwarf planet. Uh, so Pluto's eccentricity is 0 0.25, 0 0.25, um, <clears throat> a factor of um, 10 greater than the Earth's eccentricity, much, much more, 0.25. Now we move to TIC 2412, etc., uh, which is... Uh, uh, ha which has an eccentricity in its orbit of 0 0.94. So it's not very far short of one. And yeah. one uh, is not an ellipse, it's a parabola. Um, and the parabola is like an ellipse, but it's not closed at one end. It just goes on to infinity. Right. Uh, that's an eccentricity of one. So it's got this very, very high eccentricity. And that's um, really what's intrigued the scientists who've, who've uh, studied this work. Um, they, uh, they are based in a number of uh, U.S. institutions, uh, perhaps most notably at uh, Noir Lab, which we've talked about before, Noir Lab, N-O-I-R, LAB, uh, the NSF's uh, National Optical and Infrared Laboratory, uh, used to be called the NOAO, the National uh, Optical Astronomy Observatory. It's now Noala because it's got infrared in there as well. Uh, and scientists from that laboratory, they've used actually one of the telescopes that they have access to at the Kitt Peak National Observatory. Uh, it's called the WIN 3.5 meter telescope. Uh, and WIN is not that it's a winning uh, instrument, uh, although it's nice to think of it that way because it is a winner, uh, but it's an acronym. It's actually W-I-Y-N, and uh, it's operated by something called the WIN Consortium. Uh, and the, the name comes from the initials of the institutions that actually founded that consortium a number of years ago, which are University of Wisconsin-Madison, Indiana University, Yale University, and again, the what was the National Optical Astronomy Observatory. So those initials put together spell WIN, uh, which Yay. is a great name. Uh, and they have a 3.5-metre telescope, a little bit smaller than our 3.9-metre Anglo-Australian telescope here in uh, in uh, northwestern New South Wales. Or oh, there in northwestern New South Wales, not far from where you are. Um, mm. Yeah, the WIN telescope's relatively uh, recent. It's 20 years younger than the AAT. It was built in 1994 but it's got um instruments on board that let you deduce the eccentricity of the orbit of an exoplanet and that's how this discovery has been made it's really quite extraordinary and um as we've said that might be that we've now find an example of this perhaps quite short-lived phase in an exoplanet's life or in a hot jupiter's life when it migrates from the outer parts of its solar system down to the inner parts, in fact, the very innermost bit where you're almost skimming the surface of your parent star. Yeah, it, what I found fascinating, if you want to put it in um, terms that 
compared to our solar system. If this planet was in our solar system, it would be uh, in an orbit that would bring it um, 10 times closer to the sun than Mercury. Mercury, yeah. <clears throat> and then out as far as Earth. Yeah. That's that's a wild orbit. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Exactly. So that, that does put it in con con uh, very nicely into context. That's what you get when you've got an eccentricity of 0.94. You get this mm. wide range of distance. And you can imagine uh, what that does to conditions on this planet. You know, it's got... It's really hot for part of its orbit, and it's in the Goldilocks zone for the rest of it, or for the the most distant part of it. So, yeah, very very interesting to envisage what the conditions might be on the planet itself. And in terms of the long term prognosis of a planet like this, they think ultimately that they would stabilize in a in a reasonable orbit over time. This this is just sort of the beginning of a phase of movement. It, that brings yes. them into a stable orbit at some stage. That, that's right, exactly. Um, a a circuit, sort of circular orbit. So it's a, a process that's sometimes called circular, circularizing. Mm. Uh, and the, but the, it's a reasonable orbit in the sense that it's stable, but it is still um, very unusual in in our parlance because it's so close to its parent star. It's going to be, as you said. Uh, one tenth of the distance between the sun and Mercury, um, and so it's going to be very hot for its uh, the remainder of its life once this um, this instability in its current situation uh, settles down. I yeah. suppose the other question, Fred, is well, it's not a question. We don't know how close this one will end up to its parent star when it reaches stable orbit. I think that's but, right. Yes, but it's also um, brought into question why these hot Jupiters end up very close to their parent star in a lot of cases. That's something we're discovering, and um, space scientists still aren't sure why that happens. It's certainly not something that's happened in our solar system. Our gas giants are at the extremities. <clears throat> but in a lot of other systems, they're right on the... You know, yeah. they're right up there next to the star themselves. That's right. And so um, it, it's... Part of the thinking of uh, planetary scientists who look at our own solar system that yes, the uh, the giant planets have themselves migrated in their orbits, and uh, maybe they weren't formed where we see them now. Um, but clearly, they haven't migrated in the way that your average hot Jupiter has. Uh, and there's something like you know 400 of these things known, so they're yeah. not uncommon. Um, and you, you're right that the the bottom line is it's going to be. Uh, tidal forces probably that that generate this uh, this um, strange behavior the migration migration uh, process uh, of big planets uh, the forces that um, that actually govern uh, the, the, the way planets orbit uh, and you you add to that the the tidal effect of being very close to a to a large star which you you would be uh, for part of this uh, part of this eccentric orbit so yeah lots of thinking going into all that mm, fascinating uh, that's available if you'd like to read it on spacedaily.com this is space nuts Three, two, one. space nuts now, Fred, uh, our final story is one that, uh, oh, look, I don't know how to tackle this except to say to pee or not to pee. Well, when you're in space, you can't hold it for as long as you probably want to, uh, especially if you're on a spacewalk. And that's what this story is all about. When you go on a spacewalk, you can't really just duck inside to go to the loo. Uh, so you've no. got to do, you've got to do it in your suit, and the technology of today is so far advanced that you're basically doing it into a diaper uh, or a um, you know a, an absorbent pad of some kind in your suit. That's that's as far as technology's got so far. <laughs> um, but now they've come up with something new, and this I find really quite interesting. I think everybody will, especially if you're on a <laughs> spacewalk. Uh, and it's, uh, the, 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 it's certainly a piece of technology that's, uh, that, that's been designed um, to make life more easily, uh, e e more easy for space worker, walkers, not workers, walkers. Well, they are working. They're they are workers there. too, yes. Yeah. Um, and it's, um, it's, at a, it, it's been done in uh, 
sort of medical facilities in the United States have, have brought this idea together. Um, what, as you, exactly as you've said, what you've got at the moment is something, a disposable garment, effectively a diaper or a nappy, as we would call it in um, Anglo-Australian terminology. Uh, yeah. It's got a, got a posh name, though. It's, it's called a MAG. And a MAG is a, an acronym for Maximum Absorbency Garment. There you are. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, certainly better than calling it a Depend or something like that. Yeah, well, that's right, yeah. But, um, but the, um, MAGs go back quite a long time. In fact, they were apparently first dis designed in the early 1980s and have been used ever since. And what they do is they, they absorb the urine, uh, which is what we're talking about here, uh, and they, they kind of keep it there. But, you know, if you've got a spacewalk and they can take up to eight hours, they're not mm. short ventures. As you said, you can't just pop in for a pee. Um, so they can be very uncomfortable. And there's there's always the risk of things like skin, skin irritation, even infection, yes. uh, which you wouldn't want to get mixed up with. Um, and so... Uh, what has been the thinking is can you design something that collects the urine, turns it into something useful, like drinking water? Yeah. <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> now you're talking. That's right. Um, so this it actually comes from a paper uh, in Frontiers of Space Technology. It was uh, published uh, within the last few few days. Uh, and what it is is a device that you, you, you wear a thing on your back, Uh so that's fine. That's a good start. And it's got pipes that go to various bits of your body. <laughs> and once it detects, uh, and it's got a thing that detects moisture, once it detects uh, moisture in your in the region of your genitals, uh, it says, okay, uh, we need to leap into action, uh, puts on a vacuum pump that sucks the urine away uh, and puts it uh, sends it through to the backpack uh, where it go, undergoes a very, um, what might be described as fulsome filtration process. Yeah, uh, I think we're going to have to put an MA15 plus warning on this episode, the way this is going. Yeah, yeah. I'm a bit well, worried now. No, it's just a filter, but, uh, but it takes out the... <laughs> that's that's you what know. they all say. <laughs> um, uh, let me um, just... Uh, where, where are we reading? We're in... No, in no, space.com here. I was just going to yes. quote. Uh, so, so uh, you know, so basically what, uh, what space.com have said about this. Mm. Uh, the device has been shown to effectively remove the major components of urine and reduce its salt levels to meet health standards, so to make it drinkable. So, uh, and the, the Basically, you know, the, the real breakthrough here, Andrew, is that this is a process that doesn't take hours. It, it takes minutes. Uh, yeah. It's very, very rapid. And so uh, it's got the lovely spin-off that you can feed the water back to the astronaut who can then drink it as they're working. They don't have to, you know, carry a supply of water with them. They just supply it themselves. Uh, and... Um, uh, it looks like a win-win situation for, for space walkers. Yeah. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of that science fiction um, book uh, and now movie Dune because they wore what were called still suits and they reprocessed all the body's moisture into drinking water. Yes. So here's uh, science fiction into reality. Uh, absolutely. That's right. And um, I've got a feeling this space.com article mentions that, if I remember rightly. That, oh, right. Uh, uh, I guess I've heard that term before. Uh, it's funny, you know, I've been meaning to read Dune since 1969 uh, <laughs> and I've never got to it. So uh, one of my one of my good friends when I was going through my um, postgraduate studies at uh, St Andrews, he was an absolute Dune fanatic. Uh, and this is back in the day. So <laughs> I've got to catch up with that somehow. <laughs> mm. Well, these two most recent movies have been, they've, they've tried to stick as close to the books as possible. Really? So, yeah. yeah and, and they've been brilliant. They've been brilliant. Yeah. I've loved them. Uh, yeah, um, very, very, very cleverly done. Uh, special effects these days make it so much easier. Uh, when you compare it to the original Dune movie, um, you know, thirty odd years ago, it, yes. um, you look at the special effects today, and you, you sit there and you, you, you chuckle a bit. 
Um, but these days, it's uh, it's extraordinary. Uh, so to pee or not to pee, uh, it appears that it's going to be a lot easier going forward. They're still going to test this stuff out, um, and uh, hopefully you're not in trouble. Or you no, you're in trouble. No, no, I'll leave that one alone. Uh, but but the the most important question is this: this only deals with the urine problem. Um, they haven't got an answer for space floaters yet. So, well. Or space doogies or whatever you want to call them. That's, yes, that's what still, you, what, one of your favourite topics. <laughs> <laughs> that's still that's still a work in progress. Mm. Yeah, I think it would be. Uh, that's right. So, yes, it's part of the problem, Luke, so it's got a solution. I think one of the things that they really have to sort out is whether this thing will work in zero gravity. Uh, that's the thing, yeah. Tried that. yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, with vacuum technology, I, I don't see why not, but... Um, Time will tell. Time will tell. Uh, you know what worries me most, though, Fred, is that uh, when they finally get one of these things up into space and some poor bloke, I'm assuming it'll be a bloke, uh, gets yeah, out there yeah. on a spacewalk to test this thing, he's going to have to pee for an entire audience. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> think about it. That, that's, that's performance anxiety to the max. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can tell you my plumbing would certainly seize up very rapidly if that yeah. was the case. <laughs> Houston, Houston, we have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, we do indeed. Yeah. I, I can imagine the commands. Okay, release when ready. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Situation. That's when you'd say you're in trouble now. Yeah, yeah. Situation nominal, <laughs> and that's probably the best response he could give. Yeah. Yes, uh, if you want to read that, uh, as Fred mentioned, space dot com is um, the website that's covered that particular story. And uh, what a fun story it was, uh, Fred. We are done. Thank you so much. A great pleasure, Andrew. As always, I look forward to talking to you again within the next. A few years, probably. Yeah, maybe minutes. Who knows? Yeah. Just, have to, <laughs> just have to pop out for a pee first. There you go. Thanks, Fred. Yeah. See you soon. See you later. Cheers for that. Fred Watson, astronomer at large, and uh, Hugh in the studio, always helpful, always d diligent, always... Um, yeah, something, something. Uh, uh, always busy. Uh, and, uh, oh, by the way, uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe and don't forget about our social media uh, places, uh, Facebook uh, and Instagram. And uh, don't forget to visit our website and have a look around. You can do that at uh, spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io. Until next time, thanks for watching, thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts Podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.